Throughout this module, we will be discussing common statistical tests used to analyze continuous data. In this first section of the module, we will introduce the idea of parametric and nonparametric tests and discuss two specific tests, one parametric and one nonparametric, both commonly used for the analysis of two independent groups. To provide some context, let's start with a brief overview of the structure of a statistical analysis which we can think of as being comprised of three main parts. Development and specification of a statistical analysis strategy which occurs prior to collection of the data. Typically, this occurs at the grant writing or conceptualization stage of the project. Collection of the data. Analysis of the data once all data collection is complete. During the analysis strategy phase, Details about the statistical analysis plan are provided. This normally includes things like specification of the primary analytic approach, including details about key assumptions of the proposed approach and ways to assess those assumptions. One usually also references the statistical method proposed and software used to perform the analysis. Additionally, it is common to discuss alternative strategies if assumptions for the primary approach are violated. This includes specifying under what conditions the alternative will be used, for example, if the distribution of the outcome variable is highly skewed, the Mann-Whitney nonparametric test will be used. During the data analysis phase, a standard data analysis approach may include things like examination of the raw data values themselves, calculation of numerical and graphical summaries of the outcome and related variables. These summaries are generally used to evaluate the assumptions needed to conduct the statistical test. The next step is to perform the appropriate test according to the analysis strategy and report the results. A parametric test is a test based on some parametric assumption most often an assumption that the distribution of the outcome variable in the population is Gaussian. A nonparametric test does not rely on parametric assumptions, like having a Gaussian distribution. Nonparametric tests are not assumption-free, just parametric assumption-free. This figure provides an overview of the parametric and nonparametric tests we will be discussing in this module. We will first discuss tests for two independent groups, then two paired groups, and then tests for three or more independent groups. The two tests of interest in this section are the unpaired t-test and the Mann-Whitney test. We will use data on cholesterol levels to illustrate the tests of interest. This data was obtained from a study that was conducted to examine the relationship between total serum cholesterol levels and heart attack. A total of 28 male heart attack patients had their cholesterol levels measured at 2 days, 4 days, and 14 days post-attack. In addition, cholesterol levels were recorded for a control group of 30 male patients of similar age and weight who had not had a heart attack. Examining simple descriptive summaries of cases and controls, we see that among cases using the 2-day post-attack cholesterol measurement, the sample mean is 253.93 with a sample standard deviation of 47.71. Among controls, the sample mean is 193.13 with a standard deviation of 22.30. Both the mean and the standard deviation of the controls are less than those of the cases. The control mean is 60.8 less than cases and the standard deviation is less than half that of cases. Our goal is to compare mean cholesterol levels between cases and controls. It's important to remember that the goal in performing a statistical test to compare the means is not to determine whether or not this difference is clinically meaningful or clinically significant. Rather, the goal of the test is to determine whether or not the magnitude of the difference in the means, whether clinically significant or not, is consistent with random sampling variability expected under the null hypothesis of no difference between the groups. If the difference is clinically significant, the strength of the conclusion will depend on the statistical significance of the result. However, if the difference is not clinically significant, 
then the strength of the conclusion is less dependent on the statistical significance of the result. As will be discussed in the accompanying stack crunch demonstration for this section, the difference in the standard deviations has important implications relating to a key assumption of the unpaired t-test known as the equality of variances assumption. The hypothesis of interest is that total serum cholesterol levels are higher for cases at two days post attack than for control patients. We can state the null hypothesis as the mean total serum cholesterol level of cases at two days post attack is the same as the mean total serum cholesterol level of controls. Equivalently, this can also be formulated as a statement that the difference in means between cases and controls is zero. The alternative hypothesis is that the mean total serum cholesterol level of cases at two days post attack is not the same as the mean total serum cholesterol level of controls, or equivalently, that the difference in means is not zero. As usual, we will perform the test at the standard significance level of 0 0.05. The p-value generated by the unpaired t-test is less than 0 0.0001. You will note that additional information about the test is provided here along with the p-value. A t-statistic of 6.29 with df, or degrees of freedom, equal to 56. We will discuss more about the t-statistic and degrees of freedom in a moment. Suffice it to say that these values are characteristic of the test statistic for the unpaired t-test and are the basis for determination of the p-value. Since the p-value is less than or equal to 0.05, we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that our result is statistically significant. From a statistical perspective, we conclude that there is evidence to indicate that the difference in the mean cholesterol levels between cases and controls is non-zero. For reporting and evaluating the clinical implications of the results, it is recommended that the following are presented report the sample difference in means, here 60.80, report the 95% confidence interval for the difference in means, which includes values from 41.42 to 80.17, report the p-value. This provides the reader with information about the absolute magnitude of the difference, the precision of the estimated difference, and the evidence against the null hypothesis of equality. As an example, one might provide a written summary of the results of this test as shown here. Note that this statement concisely includes all of the relevant information recommended on the previous slide, including the mean standard deviation and sample size of each group. Back to the t-statistic of 6.29 with 56 degrees of freedom. The p-value is calculated from the t-statistic. The t-statistic is calculated by dividing the difference between the sample means of the two groups being compared by the standard error of that difference. Although we will not get into the details of how the standard error of the difference is calculated, because StatCrunch takes care of that for us, I will note that a key assumption of the unpaired t-test involves the standard error. The calculation assumes that the two groups being compared are sampled from populations that have identical standard deviations and thus identical variances. We will discuss more about this assumption and how to assess its validity later in the module. There are several properties of the t-statistic worth mentioning. The sign of the t-statistic only tells which mean is larger and is simply a function of the directionality of the subtraction between the means t is a ratio, it has no units. The larger t is, the smaller the p-value is. The df, or degrees of freedom for the unpaired t-test, is equal to the total subjects in both groups minus 2. For our example, the degrees of freedom is equal to 28 plus 30 minus 2 equal to 56. Thus, when the degrees of freedom are provided as part of the results, this provides information on the size of the original sample being tested. The t-statistic is generated from what's called the t-distribution. 
The T distribution is similar in shape to the Gaussian distribution, and as the degrees of freedom increase, the T distribution becomes closer and closer to a Gaussian distribution. More on this later. As is always the case, when assessing any statistical results, it is essential to review the assumptions under which the results are valid. For the unpaired t-test, we have the following assumptions. The outcome is sampled from a population with an approximately Gaussian distribution, or the sample is large enough to invoke the central limit theorem. The second assumption relates to the equality of variances assumption mentioned earlier in the presentation. For the cholesterol data, we noted standard deviations of 47.71 and 22.3 for cases and controls, respectively. Recall that the variance is simply the square of the standard deviation. There is concern about the validity of this assumption for this data. How to assess and deal with this will be discussed in the StatCrunch demo. Each observation is selected independently of the others. In summary, to perform an unpaired t-test, do the following. Calculate descriptive statistics. Produce side-by-side -side box plots. These numerical and graphical summaries should be used to assess the key assumptions of the test, Gaussian distribution of each group, and the equality of variances of the groups. Assuming that the assumptions are satisfactorily met, next calculate the p-value and confidence interval. Summarize the test results and remember to distinguish between the statistical significance and the clinical significance of the results. Before concluding this section, let's briefly return to a topic discussed in an earlier module, the duality between confidence intervals and hypothesis testing, and examine it in the context of the unpaired t-test for the cholesterol data. Shown here is the 95% confidence interval for the difference between the means of cases and controls, which extends from 41.42 to 80.17, with the difference between means equal to 60.80. This interval contains the plausible values for the difference between the population means, and as such, any value contained therein would not be rejected by an unpaired t-test conducted at a 0.05 significance level. Values found outside of this interval would be rejected by an unpaired t-test conducted at a 0.05 level. Since the value of 0 specified under the null hypothesis is not contained in the 95% confidence interval, we know without having to conduct the test that the difference in means is significant using a 0.05 significance level. Now suppose that instead of this confidence interval, we had obtained the following. A 95% confidence interval extending from minus 5.11 to 54.37. Now we have a confidence interval that does contain zero, the value specified in the null hypothesis. Since zero is in the 95% confidence interval, we know that the difference in means is not significant using a 0.05 test. Thus, Simply by calculating the 95% confidence interval, we can determine the outcome of the corresponding hypothesis test. Of course, this does not provide us with the exact p-value, simply the bound below which we know it must be. As stated previously, the general recommendation is to report both the 95% confidence interval and the exact p-value for the corresponding test. This provides a more comprehensive and complete statistical assessment of the difference between means. This concludes the first segment of our discussion of analyzing continuous data from two independent groups. In the next segment, we will discuss the nonparametric analog of the unpaired t-test known as the Mann-Whitney test.